and the message today is about the veil. We're going to take a journey from the Old Testament to the New Testament, follow the scriptures, and find the significance of the veil. Uh, we're not going to go all Raiders of the Lost Ark on you. Uh, this is just a topic that is great to contrast Old Testament and New Testament. The shadow of things to come and he who has already come, Jesus Christ. I also would like to take full responsibility for the two typos in the uh, handout. Jerry would never consider doing such a thing. So um, let's pray. Lord, we, we pray a blessing on this time, and we invite your Holy Spirit to be our teacher and anoint the message. Help us be bold to follow the path you are showing us, to desire all that you have for us, and all that you would have us do, and all that you would have us be. And we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, God ordered, by his design, the building of the temple. Behind the second veil was the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of holies, having a golden altar of incense, the Ark of the Covenant covered with gold on all sides, in which the golden jar holding the manna uh, and Aaron's rod and the tables of the covenant, and above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Now when these things had been prepared, the priest would continually enter the outer tabernacle performing divine worship. Then into the second, where the second veil is, the holiest of holies, only the high priest would enter once a year and not without taking blood, which he offers for himself for the sins of the people committed in ignorance. Uh, these uh, next scriptures are the veil scriptures. And even though they're found in many parts of the Bible, they have a wonderful flow to them. We're going to go through them together. Therefore, having such a hope, we use great boldness in our speech and are not like Moses, who used to put a veil over his face so the sons of Israel would not look intently at what was fading away. Now, if you don't know what that means in Exodus, when Moses would go visit with uh, the Lord in, uh, God in the mountain, when he would come back, his face shone. And so he would talk to the people, then put a veil over his face because he was sort of glowing and that was the Lord's glory. So, but the, but, their, but the people's minds were hardened. And until this very day, the reading of the Old Covenant, that same veil remains. And it's unlifted because it is removed only in Christ. And even if our gospel is veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So their, their minds are, are blinded and they're, because they're unbelieving and they have hardness of heart. So what we want to remember is the devil is prowling around on this earth like a roaring lion, scripture says, because he knows he has a short time. He his lures and his schemes are lies, deceit, division, hatred, darkness, corruption, perversion, distraction, and more lies. He's the father of lies. But when Jesus approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and he wept over it, saying, if you had only known this day, even you, the things that make peace, but now they have been hidden from your eyes. Church, are we weeping? Are we weeping over our cities? But though he had performed many signs before them, yet they were not believing him. So we know there'll be those who will not hear the gospel from us. It was so for Jesus and his disciples, but we still have to do and say the things we're led to do by the Holy Spirit. And some may take that seed of truth and act on it later where someone else would water and God would give the increase. So that shouldn't detour us from whatever God is leading us to do or say at this present time. And we do not want to be distracted by the world and the things of the world that are going wrong. It's a terrible distraction. And we want to keep our eyes focused on what God's doing. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as 
as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations. Now the word for that is imaginations. And their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. So they knew God. Well, the devil knows God and all the demons know God. Knowing him is not enough. We need to love him and worship him and obey him and serve him and walk with him. Being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that's in them, because of the hardness of their heart. And they, having become callous, have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. But you did not learn Christ in this way. So it becomes, again, a, a matter of hardness of heart. And I think uh, it's interesting because the Lord's scripture says, the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard our hearts. Well, I looked that up in the Amplified, and it says it will, he will mount a garrison around your heart with that peace. Yes, hallelujah. And Ezekiel says, uh, for the words of the Lord, it says, I will give you a new heart, and I will put a new spirit within you, and I will remove your heart of stone. So we just never want to give up. If anyone's breathing, they can still be prayed for, no matter which relative it is, and, and, and friend, and, and co-worker, and everything. So, And if you're dead, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, or I say culture of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, which is the evil one, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. So these scriptures are very difficult to hear, aren't they? And they, they're unsettling the hard hearts and the disbelief. But here's the true statement. So were we formerly. And so now we need to be the salt and light and the seed sowers and the prayer warriors. And we need to tell our story about our encounter with Jesus and all the wonderful things he's done for us. So this is not about your Uncle Harold. And this is not about the grumpy people down the street or the people on the other side of whatever side your side is. This isn't a culture war. It's a spiritual warfare. And, and uh, Jude 1 says this, And of some have compassion, making a difference. And of others, save with fear, pulling them from the fire. See, can you see that this is spiritual warfare for the eternal lives of people God has sent his son to die for? So we don't want to be distracted by our culture, by our, our, uh, the schemes of the evil one, the division, the arguing, the debates over things that are not eternal. We want to keep our eye on the prize, and we want to work with Jesus to win his souls to heaven because the time is short and we can make a difference and we, we should make a difference and we should be different. So what's the different, what is different for those who believe? Well, in the Old Testament, let me just change my foot here. Um, Aaron was designated to be a priest in the temple. And this is interesting, Exodus, uh, the whole chapter of chapter 28 and the whole chapter of chapter 29 are devoted specifically to the clothing he had to wear and the sacrifices he should present when he enters the holiest of holies on pain of death. But in the New Testament, Jesus became the perfect sacrifice once and for all, and we're clothed in his righteousness. In the Old Testament, Aaron only went to the holiest of holies once a year. In the New Testament, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? But you are the chosen race. You are the priests, the royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies in him, of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. So we have the privilege of proclaiming his excellencies and not to be silenced. 
This is by God's design and grace and nothing that we have done for ourselves. In the Old Testament, veiled, but in the New Testament, unveiled. But whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. But we all with unveiled faces, beholding as a mirror the glory of the Lord, as being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord the Spirit. So we are the unveiled because of Jesus Christ. And a dramatic example of that is when Paul was struck down and he lost his sight and he didn't eat or drink. And when he got healed, he regained his sight back, the scales fell from his eyes, he was filled with the Holy Spirit and baptized. Just a short example of that beautiful um, example of being veiled and then unveiled. In the Old Testament, the a high priest could only enter the holiest of holies once a year. In the New Testament, therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh, Jesus' death gave us access to the holiest of holies, and he took away all of our sins. Praise the Lord. So what should our attitude be? God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. That's God's attitude toward the world. We need to take on God's attitude toward the world and not the world's attitude. Our attitude of the world must be one of love. We have to be the same in the marketplace as we are at home. We have to be the same with our saved friends as we are with our unsaved friends. And the Lord told me quite, quite loudly in my own ear, even in the car, Linda. So, uh, and I'm not kidding. <laughs> I, was, I, was, uh, I was hit by a um, truck going 50 miles an hour when I was at a stoplight. So um, I'm freaky in the car anyway. And when people cut me off or follow me too closely, I get a shot of adrenaline. That doesn't mean I have to <clears throat> say anything. So uh, the Lord and I are working on that in a loving way. So, uh, but love, loving consistently is what's going to be making a big difference in the world. And Jesus is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him. To the uttermost, we can be confident he's got us. And since he always lives to make intercession for them. So Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven and prays always for us. Now he could have, after his death, he, he finished everything. He could have gone up there and just been the kingly king that he is. But he prays always for us. And we must pray, church. We must pray. We must be devoted in prayer and with thanksgiving. And we want to join with Jesus to do this. And we want to rescue those from the fire, don't we? Yes. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. This is the heart of compassion we want to have. Isn't this, as you just see people in the stores and and and, and that you encounter, they are, they are harassed, especially in this climate. And the way things have been going the last two years have been so difficult for people. If we have a heart of compassion for them and no hatred and no unforgiveness and not be easily offended by anything, I really believe that we would have more signs, more wonders, and more miracles with this heart if we had love and a heart of compassion. And this is what Jesus says, a new commandment I give you love one another as i have loved you so you must love one another that's awesome isn't it i mean he isn't making a suggestion and he is not asking us he's commanding us and he would not be making a commandment like that if it was not possible he would never do that to us so by his grace the power of his holy spirit and our cooperation to want to be like him it can happen, it will happen. And verse 35 says, by this all men will know that you are my disciples 
that you love one another. So that's our shining light. That's our shining light. God will use that in the world to draw people to him, and we want to cooperate with his grace. If we really think this is the end times, we've got lots of collecting and harvesting to do, don't we? Yes, together and in unity with Christ, he will give us everything we need to accomplish that because he wants to use us. He could do it himself. He could have the angels come and do it, but he wants to use us. What a privilege that is. So we're going to proclaim his excellencies. So the new, here's the new covenant. With, grace, with Christ by grace, you've been saved and raised up with him and seated with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That is not someday, that is today. We are in heavenly places right now. And this is the wonderful conclusion verse. But when Christ appeared as the high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood, he entered the holy place once and for all. Remember, he said he made his sacrifice once and for all, and now he's entered into the holiest of holies once and for all. For Christ did not enter, oh, having obtained eternal redemption. For Christ did not enter a holy place made with hands, a mere copy of the true one. So we have the Old Testament temple, and we have Jesus. And he's saying, but heaven itself is where he entered. And now, to appear in the presence of God for us, he has been manifested to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. So through the plan of God, the obedience of Christ, the power of the Holy Spirit, and their great love for us, Jesus from the cross said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. And Christ said again, it's finished. And the curtain of the, ta ta of the temple was torn into. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Thank you for your sacrifice for being the Lamb of God who has taken away our sin and brought us into your loving covenant. Help us to be more like you, kind and loving, full of compassion, willing to sacrifice our time to pray for the world so that all who come to you will be in unity. Keep us on your holy path. Your word is a lamp to our feet. Please speak to us through your word. Thank you for the cross, Lord, and tearing down the veil that separated you and your Father from us. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen.